Hello and welcome to Podcast DX, the show that brings you interviews with people just like you whose lives were forever changed by a medical diagnosis. I'm Lita. I'm Ron. Jean Marie is not here with us uh, right now, and collectively we are the host of Podcast DX. This week's topic may be especially upsetting for some and may not be appropriate for young listeners. Parental discretion is advised. Today we are talking about factitious disorder imposed on another, or FDIA. You may have heard of this condition a lot recently in the news, films, and on television, where it is referred to someone by the more antiquated phrase, Munchausen syndrome by proxy. So, before we talk with our guest, Craig, let's cover some basic information regarding FDIA. Okay, FDIA is a form of abuse and it is a criminal offense. Well, Uh, what exactly is factitious disorder imposed on another? I'm glad you asked. According to the Cleveland Clinic, (laughs) factitious disorder imposed on another, or FDIA, is a mental illness. The individual with FDIA acts as if an individual that they are caring for has a physical or mental illness when the person that they are caring for really is not sick. The adult perpetrator has the diagnosis FDIA and directly produces or lies about illnesses in another person under their care. Typically the victim is, but not always, a child under the age of six. There have been cases with adult victims, especially the disabled or elderly. As mentioned earlier, FDIA is considered a form of abuse by the American Professional Society on the Abuse of Children. In addition to factitious disorder imposed on another, there is also factitious disorder imposed on self, also known as Munchausen syndrome. This is a factitious disorder wherein Those affected feign illnesses, pretend that they have illnesses or disease or psychological trauma. They do this in order to draw attention, sympathy, or reassurance for themselves. What might cause someone to develop factitious disorder imposed on another or self? Well, again, according to the Cleveland Clinic, people with FDIA have an inner need for the other person, often it's his or her child, To be seen as ill or injured, it's not done to achieve a concrete benefit such as financial gain, that would be fraud. People with FDIA are even willing to have the child or patient undergo painful or risky tests and operations in order to get the sympathy and special attention given to people who are truly ill and their families. Factitious disorders are considered mental illnesses because they are associated with severe emotional difficulties. Right, and the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders 5, otherwise known as the DSM-5, is the standard reference book for recognized mental illnesses here in the United States. It describes this diagnosis to include falsification of physical or psychological signs or symptoms, and induction of illness or injury to another associated with deception. There is no evidence of external rewards and no other illness to explain the symptoms. Fortunately, this is a rare disorder affecting around 2 out of 100,000 children. Well, that's good. Mm -hmm. Although the exact cause of FDIA is not known, Researchers believe both biological and psychological factors play a role in the development of the disorder. Some theories suggest that a history of abuse or neglect as a child or the early loss of a parent might be factors in its development. Some evidence, however, suggests that major stress, such as marital problems, may trigger an FDIA episode. Wow. How might somebody recognize a case of FDIA? Well, according to the Cleveland Clinic, a person with FDIA may be a parent, usually a mother, but there have been cases where the individual with FDIA was the adult child of an elderly patient, spouse, or caretaker of a disabled adult. 
They might be a healthcare professional who is very friendly and cooperative with the healthcare providers. A person may appear quite concerned, some might even say overly concerned, about the child or designated patient. And the individual with FDIA may also suffer from factitious disorder imposed on self. This is a related disorder in which the individual repeatedly act as if they have a physical or mental illness when they themselves have caused the symptoms. Wow, that's complicated. Very. Some of the possible warning signs of FDIA in children may include the following. The child has a history of many hospitalizations, often with a strange set of symptoms. Worsening of the child's symptoms generally is reported by the mother and is not witnessed by the hospital staff or healthcare provider. The child's reported condition and symptoms do not agree with the results of the diagnostic tests. There might be more than one unusual illness or death of children in the family. The child's condition improves in the hospital, but symptoms reoccur when the child returns home. Blood in lab samples might not match the blood of the child. Wow. There might be signs of chemicals in the child's blood, stool, or urine. That, that's certainly a lot. Yeah. Are there any treatments available for someone with FDIA? And what about the victim? Well, uh, the Cleveland Clinic says that the first concern in cases of FDIA is to ensure the safety and protection of any real or potential victims. This might require that the child be placed in the care of another. In fact, managing a case involving FDIA often requires a team that includes social workers, foster care organizations, and law enforcement, as well as the health care providers. Successful treatment of people with FDIA is difficult because those with the disorder often deny that there's a problem. In addition, treatment success is dependent on catching the person in the act or the person telling the truth. People with FDIA tend to be such accomplished liars that they begin to have trouble telling fact from fiction. Psychotherapy generally focuses on changing the thinking and behavior of the individual with the disorder. The goal of therapy for FDIA is to help the person identify the thoughts and feelings that are contributing to the behavior and to learn to form relationships that are not associated with illness. Generally, FDIA is a very difficult disorder to treat and often requires years of therapy and support. Social services, law enforcement, children's protective services, and physicians must function as a team to stop the behavior. This disorder can lead to serious short and long-term complications, including continued abuse, multiple hospitalizations, and the death of the victim. Research suggests that the death rate for victims of FDIA is about 10%, and in some cases, a child victim of FDIA learns to associate getting attention to being sick and develops factitious disorder imposed on self. Wow. And can FDIA be prevented? Well, again, going back to the Cleveland Clinic, there is no known way to prevent this disorder. However, it might be helpful to begin treatment in people as soon as they begin to have symptoms. Removing the child or other victim from the care of the person with FDA can prevent further harm to the victim. Okay. Well, now let's talk with Craig about FDIA. Hello and welcome to another episode of Podcast DX, the show that brings you interviews with people just like you whose lives were forever changed by a medical diagnosis. I'm Lita. I'm Ron. And I'm Jean Marie. Collectively, we're the host of Podcast DX. On today's show, we are speaking with Craig about factitious disorder imposed on another, previously called Munchausen by proxy. Craig Lewis is a rebel, and he chooses to live his life built on a foundation of gratitude, peace, love, kindness, spirituality, accountability, honor, forgiveness, and acceptance. He is currently living in a mountain in Mexico, seeking truth, healing, and connection. 
Without question, Craig continues to rise even higher on the mission to be the living proof to all that surviving the impossible is entirely possible. Craig recently published his book, Better Days, in, let's see, one, two, three, four, five languages. Wow. Finnish, Dutch, Spanish, Tagalog, and Thai, with several new translations on the way, including Kishwahili and Italian. Craig actively trains mental health workers, educators, people in recovery, and all interested people throughout the world, and is excited about benefiting organizations and the lives of all via his experience, wisdom, and fearlessness. Craig, it sounds like you're the person to talk to. Hi, Craig. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm so grateful to be here with you all. Great, thanks. Craig, um, could you start off by telling us um, earlier, Lita mentioned this fictitious disorder imposed on another. Uh, what is that? As you stated uh, previously, it was previously called Munchausen's Syndrome by Proxy. And this is an uncommon and unusual set of circumstances that I've experienced. And in a nutshell, to describe what it is, and I can only speak really anecdotally because I experienced this as the victim. Okay. I guess not that I like that word, mm-hmm. but, but what this is, what, what fictitious disorder imposed on another is, is when another person, usually the mother, your mother, for some reason, and I know there are many reasons I, I can suspect, uh, does things that causes their child to react. In my case, it was a, uh, a mental health kind of a reaction, and it's basically a set of behaviors that a mother with a support of a father usually will engage in unknowingly, I think it's fair to say, unknowingly that when the child reacts, and in my case, it was a child that can also happen to like elderly people, but when the child reacts, the child is then identified as being the problem when, in fact, the child might be responding to a severe set of circumstances, behavioral um, circumstances, if you will, emotional abuses, psycholo- uh, psychological abuses. And, and, and in my situation, and what this is in general, is when a parent does things and the the receiving person responds, and then the receiving person is labeled sick. And, okay. And basically, that's what it is. Okay. And what might cause somebody to develop this disorder? Condition. Yes, mm-hmm. this condition. Well, in my situation, because I really could, because this is a rare thing, it's mm-hmm. hard to remember anyone else's life. Sure, sure, mm-hmm. I understand that. In my family, and I've actually done a bit of research about this because my job is to speak, and I actually have created a life talking about this because it's awful. And however, it also to, to describe what could cause it, it also requires a foundation of having a foundation of empathy. Now, that might be odd for many people who are abuse, abuse survivors, but the only way to really understand this is to look at it with an empathetic lens. So how would somebody develop this sort of really um, odd set of behaviors that are so devastating to others? In my case, as far as I can, I can state, I'm aware that and I know this is a more um, general question, but it's really, I have to speak from my experience. Sure. sure. So my parents were mistreated as children. They're both in their 70s right now. And I know they were mistreated. They grew up during the World, World War II. Our family is Jewish. They grew up in the United States. I know that my grandmothers were not kind to them. I know there was a lot of, oh, a lack of love in the home. And, and I think when you are uh, growing up as a child, and during uh, very intense times, and there's a lack of love, or whatever love is, is a, mm, it's the right word, a distorted, uh, uh, a distorted idea or, uh, or, or a distorted manifestation of what love is supposed to be, like what most, most families might consider, oh, we love our children, this is love. In my family, and I think how my parents both grew up in their independent homes when they were children, I think what love was was actually a transactional kind of uh, relationship that also was not 
built on anything substantial as far as like we love this person because they are they are ours they are our flesh and blood we have a family with them we have reasons to be connected to them in my family both my parents as far as i can state grew up in these environments so when they got married i'm certain unbeknownst to them they both had the same sort of upbringing that is so rare and strange that most people would not connect and find each other and then ostensibly fall in love. And and this example is, is, is about my family, but it's general, that my parents had me when they were in their early 30s or so, and I was born in 1973. And of course, they had no idea that they were not going to be good parents. They didn't know that they were terrible parents. They didn't know they had no idea how to love. And thus, as I was growing up, I reacted to their behaviors, which were abusive. And I can only imagine that it was a need for attention, a need to be loved, a need to be understood and cared for, because I'm certain, at the best of my uh, knowledge to state this, that both of my parents grew up in environments where that was not what most families consider the norm, like love, connection, compassion, caring, kindness. And because, and I know that we talked about when childhood syndrome or proxy or uh, fictitious disorder imposed upon another, um, as just a mother, which is generally the way it is. But in my case, both my parents had the same sort of behaviors. My father was indeed uh, like the unwilling or the unintentional co-conspirator because it's all about not knowing. Mm-hmm. They didn't realize what they were doing. So that is one reason or one way that this happened. And I'm certain there are people out there who have had similar experiences with greatly different uh, circumstances who can hear what I'm saying and say, okay, that's strange and weird and odd and painful, and I understand it. Because there's no real good way to just explain how this would happen because it's so rare and strange. Mm -hmm. It requires a strange set of circumstances in the first place for the behaviors to manifest and then be like as the words used in descriptions that you've given me, perpetrators, I don't like using that word, mm-hmm. but a degree of innocence, the degree of innocence here on my parents' part, and I said, no, that just mere the foundation of empathy has come from in order for my own life to progress. But in a nutshell, that's the best answer I think can give to you right now uh, for your question. Okay. And how have you personally been affected by this? How have I personally been affected? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, when I was a kid, my parents had to go to great lengths to have uh, med- uh, mental health professionals deem me a sick child. You know how this all works is that if the parent is, is conducting themselves in, in ways that are so dysfunctional that the child is, is reacting in such extreme ways, well, it's not something of benefit to the parents for the rest of the world to view them as the issue. And in our current pharmaceutically driven day and age, there's a diagnosis and there's an uh, a pill for everything, apparently. And when you have parents, and this is really to the core of your question of how it's been affected, when your parents have the money and the control and the power and the choice, and the vehicle, and the home, and everything, and you're the child, you're going to be affected in extreme and odd and unusual ways. And for example, my parents had to go out of their way repeatedly to find doctors who would agree with them that I was a sick child with mental health challenges. And I could tell the story. I think I'm going to do that in a minute when you ask the question. However, how was I affected? Lifelong effect. I was drugged, diagnosed, and incarcerated at a young age. And, well, now I'm 45 years old, and I'm not drugged and incarcerated. And that's really why I reached out to you and why we're having this conversation. So I'll wait. Right, it, right, right. It, it is a good topic to, uh, to share with and others. And we're glad you have reached out to us. Yes, right. for sure. So I was diagnosed as a result of my parents' lack of wellness and their need to have a sick child for attention, which is fine that people need attention because they're hurt, they expect that people are hurt, 
They needed to have a sick child. We're all looking at each other in disbelief over your story. It's and it, we're not disbelief that in we shock. In shock. shock that, that's that somebody would have to go through this and tolerate this. Well, and, and what it reminds me of is um, before women had the right to vote, and the men, their husbands were it went they yes. went from their father's home to their husband's home, and if they did not do exactly or say or behave in the way in which that in that male individual wanted them to they would be institutionalized with hysteria as a general That's catch-all true. term right right and the care that they might receive might include shock therapy and, well, no, and lobotomy shock, lobotomies and, is right, what i was right, going to say right. it might and it there you know so it's you know the individual wasn't acting the way they wanted to and they and you know the mental health care providers were more than happy to do whatever the that individual wanted them to do because they had the money to right, pay for it because they had the money to pay for it right and then also it also kind of reminds me of people that are seeking out plastic surgery and after plastic surgery after plastic surgery and it's not they're not seeing what everyone else sees and there are surgeons out there that will perform surgery upon surgery even if that individual doesn't maybe actually need that surgical care mm-hmm. and doesn't need additional yeah. treatment right right it you, is. you hit- it's a story that we've never heard before, but we are happy that you reached out to us for yeah. sure. <laughs> yeah, thank you. you. You have nailed it with your uh, comparison to what women experienced about 80 years ago and, or longer in the United States, mm-hmm. where where the husband was the one. He's the controller. You'll do what he says. Mm-hmm. And, and if you don't like it, well, we can just have you taken away. Right. It, it, including, mm-hmm. not just like because you don't like how someone believes or they're not doing what you want them to do, including if uh, back in the day, of course, I guess this still happens now, perhaps, a man decides, oh, I want a younger wife. Sure. Or I right. want a new wife. Right. They can just, they can just have the, the woman taken away to a hospital and locked away. And of course, what does a person do? Perfect, perfect um, kind of uh, view into my experience. It's the same thing. What does a person do? When all of a sudden, people say, oh, there's something wrong with you. We're going to come take you away. The first thing you do is you yell and scream. You kick and you bite and you fight. You say, this is un- unbelievable. You're coming after me. Wait a second. Listen to me. Let me t- no, 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 no. Injection or strap down, and then you're done. There's a piece here that goes a step beyond. Uh, that what All you just said, which is a good way to describe it. My parents took the extreme step of threatening a psychiatrist with a lawsuit if he did not change my medical records to state that I was mentally ill and not what he originally or initially deemed me in in, in line with previous psychiatrists and a whole history of people trying to stand up for me and who were silenced because my parents refused to sign releases of information for anyone who did not believe in these sickness narrative that they had to, to, to perpetuate. I have a document written by clinicians in a facility I was living in or incarcerated in that states that a phone call occurred, and it's like a, not a transcript, I don't know the right word, it's, it's when you summarize a phone call, so it's not, mm-hmm. not word for word, but it's a summary written by a licensed clinician that states what I just said to you, that my mother called up and they said she's screaming at us, threatening the psychiatrist with a lawsuit if they don't change the, the medical file to say that I was mentally ill <laughs> and not what the doctor had told me, which is my parents did help and I was not in that place as an appropriate placement. The doctor ultimately, upon threat, threat, changed the medical file, and then I was, at that point on, heavily uh, drugged with like 1980s era old school antipsychotics, and at that point I became a shell. And I couldn't defend myself, and they put in situations that were horrific. And, um, well, I survived. And that's, I think that's really why I'm, I reached out to you, because I, well, I have no need. Surviving we're glad, is, yes. We yes. are glad you are here, um, and, and those are some horrible experiences. That no child should ever have to. Right. Absolutely. Through. But that actually does lead into the next question that we have. Those experiences as a child and as an adolescent... Um, how did they lead you to the career that you currently have? Well, great question. Thank you. Um, well, it took me, um, 
I can say initially in the in the mid 2000s I hit, hit rock bottom. You know, I had they changed the diagnosis over the years. At first, it was like temporary schizophrenia, you know, schizophrenia form. Then I was diagnosed with schizophrenia. Then I was diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder. Then I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Then I was diagnosed with uh, ADHD. And I hit rock bottom. I really hit rock bottom. And and I could not hold relationships. I could not hold a job. I could not like, keep my apartment. And society viewed me as a sort of like problematic figure. And in fact, I was made sick. It wasn't my fault. I wasn't even aware because I was so drugged. So how did this lead to my current career? In the mid-2000s, I sought out a therapist. I went through a process. She validated me. I began a process of going to school. I went to school. Ultimately, uh, in this process, I became a certified peer specialist, meaning I was a person with that experience who worked in the mental field who would open about their challenges. And then, years later, uh, I, I had an internship. I graduated my program. I worked, I worked, I worked, I worked. I had created a curriculum via my internship in volunteering, which is a peer support group format. I, over the course of five or six years, I facilitated this group of different spots. Ultimately, I stopped doing it, and then I published this book, which is a, a Better Days, a Mental Health Recovery Workbook. I published this from the papers that were created during the years of giving a volunteer peer support group, which is part of my internship, going back to school. And I had no idea that this was going to be a successful book. It was never intended to be published. It was never intended to be a career. In fact, I never thought I'd do anything more than a line worker in a group home or like some sort of center. So this all took off without me having any idea that that was going to happen or intending on doing it or ever planning on having it happen. My family has disowned me. I forgive them. They do not know what they do. They gave me an ultimatum that if I continue to talk about childhood trauma, what happened to me, I would not be part of the family any longer. They enforced that. And um, ultimately, um, I healed. I had some cognitive brain damage from all these drugs. It took me a long time. I became homeless. I lost almost everything I had. My cat, my home, all my belongings, most of my friends. And I, I said, screw it. Why should I continue to be miserable in a place that makes me unhappy? I picked up. I got, uh, I picked myself up. I got a plane ticket. I flew to Europe one way. I spent 15 months traveling in Europe and then in Canada and then in Mexico, a little bit in the U.S., doing workshop after workshop in country after country, paving my way with a backpack and almost no money and no support and no ability to speak the language, no medical help, nothing. And ultimately, I found many people around the world who wanted to partner with me. And then I began giving workshops in country after country. My book then became, my, my, I, I pursued translators. I engaged in this process. And I published a book in now almost 10 languages. Wow. And how did I end up in Mexico? Well, when you're me with my history, with my parents, and psychiatry, and money, in the current state in the United States, it is not hospitable for someone like me who's been victimized to, to the degree I've had with the amount of people who are, I guess, at risk for me speaking the truth because it means someone else, meaning many people, didn't do the right thing. So I ended up in a place where I have a visa where I'm legal to live, and it's inexpensive, and it's beautiful, and no one's going to bother me. That's right. how I ended up. Here. Right. Okay. And, and Craig, I, noticed, I have personally noticed, but apparently um, – Lita and Ron have not noticed that there's been an uptick or an upswing in media about FDIA, formerly known as Munchausen by, uh, syndrome by proxy, as of late. Um, do you find yourself relating to any of those stories as they're being told in the media and through um, you know, movies and all of the different um, articles that are coming out nowadays? I know there's like the, you know, with Gypsy Rose and other individuals um, who have been affected by this syndrome. How do you feel about all that? I, I think it's good that the media is talking about it. And, and as I was listening to you, um, you know, tell your story and about everything you've been through, it, I guess I do like to make analogies. It reminded me of, of um, studies done with primates and primates who, for whom with uh, love and affection is withheld. It has a severe effect on their behavior, how they're able to cope and everything of that nature. So that just, it does, it reminds me of that. So I, um, you know, can kind of understand where that, all that is coming I brought, from. 
I'd probably get along with primates more than I would with most, with most humans. I certainly get along with cats mm-hmm. better than I do with humans, so, you know, that says a lot. And, and um, I understand that, uh, you know, you, you've worked as a peer-to-peer specialist. You're a published author. Um, where can we find a copy of your book? And actually, you have more than one book available, I believe, we saw on Amazon. Yeah. Okay. Well, currently, my websites are not really functioning properly. I've had a really hard couple of years. I just got housing for the first time after a year and a half not having a house. So things have been rough. Um, but I'm okay. The best thing that someone can do is try not to go to Amazon to get my books. Because Amazon does not treat people like us very well. They take off the money from people like me. But if you go on Amazon, you can read all sorts of amazing reviews about the better days in mental health recovery workplace. A better place, however, to get the book so I, as the author, become uh, or are better compensated. You can just search search for on Google Lulu.com and Better Days Recovery Press. Okay. So search for Lulu.com. I'm a self-published author. Lulu.com, Better Days Recovery Press, and they'll okay. find my website. They'll find a website with all the books there, okay. all the languages. Um, and then. They can write to me directly. My email is there. They can write to me directly if they want to make a direct order, but wink, wink is the best way. And if you want to buy a whole bunch of books, write to me directly. Don't get them in, online from the distributor. Go to me. I'm the guy to go to. Um, I, of course, have an email address, um, betterdaysrecovery at gmail.com, betterdaysrecovery at gmail.com. Okay, great. Um, I'm grateful to have been embraced by you all and included uh, on your wonderful podcast. Yeah, I'm we're really grateful we're really grateful that you reached out to us. Yeah, and took the time. Yeah, to speak yes. with us. If our listeners have any questions or comments related to today's show, they can contact us at podcastdx at yahoo.com, through our website, podcastdx.com, on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, or Instagram. And if you have a moment to spare, please give us a review wherever you get your podcast. As always, please keep in mind that this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of uh, your physician or other qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition and or treatment and before undertaking a new healthcare regime. And never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you've heard in this podcast. Till next week. (laughs) 